um, the Continuous Delivery Foundation Interactive Landscape and sort of what we can expect for the future in terms of CDF. But first, I think what we'll do is we will, I'll do some shameless promotion of myself. Um, again, I'm Tracy Reagan. I am the CEO and co-founder of Deploy Hub. Uh, we are a microservice management platform um, that really specializes in putting configuration ma management back into a microservice architecture. I'm on the board of the Continuous Delivery Foundation, and I actually was on the board of the Eclipse Foundation, one of the founding members, which was a great uh, experience to learn about governance and open source. Uh, I live in New Mexico. I spend a lot of times with my horse and my dogs, and I am a serial volunteer. I do a lot of volunteer work for the community, and that's probably why I love open source so much. So let's talk just a little bit about the Continuous Delivery Foundation. It's a pretty exciting new foundation under the Linux uh, Foundation. Um, the Continuous Delivery Foundation it seeks to improve the world's capacity to deliver software with both security and speed. Uh, we're always thinking about better ways to push and progress software through the life cycle. And there is no better time than now to have this, this conversation, and the CD Foundation provides a platform for that conversation. Our goal is to, to work on establishing best practices, propel the education and adoption of continuous delivery, and to facilitate cross-pollination. And when we talk about cross-pollination, we're not just talking about between vendors, but also between end users. Our end user community is very, very important. So if we think about how the CD um, Foundation sees uh, continuous delivery, we see it as an engineering approach um, in which teams produce software in these short cycles, ensuring that software can be reliab reliably delivered really at any time. Now, the rise in microservices and cloud-native architecture has changed how that continuous delivery um, process works. And that is what is so important right now in terms of this bigger conversation about how we're managing the pipeline, how it changes, and what we need to be thinking about for the future. So I know I hear this all the time. I hear, you know, I ask people about, you know, doing uh, continuous deployments or doing continuous testing or doing continuous integration. And they say, yeah, we've got one and it's, it's quite nice. <laughs> and I know you have a pipeline and I know you may have be doing continuous integration. Most companies are. Um, but your quest for perfection is not quite over. We have some work to do. And the whole idea of CI and CD um, will be shifting. So what is driving this, this change? Um, I think what we should think about is modern architecture and how modern architecture really is different from our traditional monolithic approach. Um, and AI and machine learning needs modern architecture. It needs the ability to be fault tolerant, self-healing, and being able to auto scale. That is the talking about the future of employment and how susceptible jobs are to computerization. Now, while that's all really scary for many people when it comes to, um, you know, robots, uh, robot uh, baristas and just automation from, uh, you know, accountants, um, it means that we're going to have a pretty interesting road ahead of us for software developers. We have a lot of software to write um, in, this new, in this new world. But the truth of the matter is the way we've put software together has now been broken. Um, when it comes to microservice development, according to this O'Reilly survey, only 15% of companies really report massive success with microservices. And there is confusion about how microservices are managed, um, in particular tracking um, which service is being used in which cluster and what the logical view of the application looks like. Or in other words, according to Randy Hefner, um, microservice development can fall apart without a coherent and disciplined and management, managed approach. Now that approach is going to be um, 
pretty much re very relied upon by the CD the process. The CD process will be critical in how you manage your microservices in the future and figure out how this stuff is put together. So um, in traditional methods, uh, you know, we have sorted out a lot of this business, but in a broken down micro or in a, in a decomposed microservice world, it starts to change. First of all, developers tend to struggle with sharing and finding microservices. DevOps teams can't necessarily see the entire picture. And what we're trying to achieve is some level of business agility as it relates to these ML and AI types of applications. And without being able to build a CD pipeline that can support many moving parts moving across the, the pipelines very quickly, we will fail. So think about it as taking a, a wine glass and taking a hammer to it, pointing to it and saying, there's your wine glass. It's still there. The application is still there. Everything we need to do about that, we have a user that's actually using that wine glass, but it's all broken into small parts. So how do we, how do we start thinking about the CD pipeline in terms of managing that wine glass and all these broken parts? So this is the biggest problem I, that I see with um, companies moving from a monolithic to a microservice approach. When you're in monolithic, you have sorted out much of this stuff. And we see most of what we do based on an application version. We build an application version. We test an application version. Um, we track it. We deploy it. We track tickets based on it. We do change requests based on it. But in a, in a microservice environment, we're moving away from it. I, I like to say we have thrown the baby out with the bathwater. We still need the application and the application is still there. We just need to start seeing it as a logical collection of microservices and treat it the same. It's no less of an uh, application if it's built into lots of microservices, but we have to start treating it that way. The key to understanding the uh, microservices, is, if you hadn't started working on them yet, is to to manage how we manage our Kubernetes environments, and we've made a lot of progress on that. We now need to start turning our, and, and turning our heads and our, our focus to how do we manage the applications running there. Uh, and to, to, to really kind of emphasize the, the challenge here is microservices are immutable. Unlike the way we used to do things, take a jar file and deploy it and copy over it, um, we know that um, what, my mic is off. Okay. Should I switch to the phone? Huh. Check my connection and continue. Well, it says that my... They're having trouble with my mic, and I don't see that. Please take your phone off the speakerphone for now. Hello? So is it not working? Okay, okay, thanks. All right, sorry guys, looks like I'm having internet uh, connection, so hopefully this stays um, clean. So anyways, if you're, if you're really working in a microservice environment, you're really having to struggle with keeping track of how microservices connect to each other. And again, on the production side of the house, we're learning to track things with, um, with uh, AP.
ways that we can start building out our CD pipeline to, um, to support it. So let's just really talk about the pipeline, um, the, the, uh, the landscape, and how that's going to start changing. Now let's talk about pipeline orchestration. Continuous integration and continuous delivery is what I like to refer to as pipeline orchestration. Um, should I use the phone now? Hello? How do I, do I need to do, I want it now, is there something I have to do from my, the, how do I do that? I don't have speakers. I can unplug my headphones. My headphones unplugged. Does that mean I'm now? Am I good? Okay, so pipeline orchestration is an important piece of what we're trying to um, address. And when I think about pipeline orchestration, I am talking about tools like CircleCI and Jenkins. These tools are really managing what you're doing inside your, within your pipeline. Um, you know, they don't do testing themselves, they don't do compiles themselves, but they orchestrate it. The orchestration of the pipeline will begin to change. And the way it changes is because we start having lots of workflows in your pipeline. So instead of having one big, you know, managing one big jar file, you're going to manage lots of little pieces, lots of little functions. So your workflow may go from, uh, you know, one, work, one workflow per application version, for example, to 10, 15, or hundreds of workflows that aggregate up to an application version. Now, what I'm seeing in the industry today is uh, some shifts to um, create better templating services so that you can support multiple workflows where you, if you have lots of workflows, you make a change at the high level, and then from, uh, from that change, any child workflows get that fixed. That's going to be really, really critical for the CD pipelines of the future. The other thing is events. This whole idea of events processing, um, it, I find to be fascinating. I feel like it's going to be really, really critical because if you're having, if you have 15 workflows that you're running at a time, you, you know, that, that can work just fine. But if you're running 100 or 1,000, you're going to want to have events that can be parallelized and processing things all at the same time. So that's going to change. And look for templated, event, template work, templated workflows and CD pipelines that are going to be event-driven. So some of those tools that we're seeing now, um, you can think about uh, Jenkins X, um, is you know, pushed everything to a pipeline to, to create templated environments. Um, Tekton is really sort of an event-driven kind of a solution. And then Eiffel's out there. That's a, a messaging uh, kind of, of, of process. These are the kinds of tools that you're gonna, we're going to be seeing in the future that's really going to change the way we uh, see our pipeline orchestration. It's a pretty, a pretty big shift, and I think the sooner we all get our heads around it and understand it, the, the better off we're all going to be. Okay, software builds and release. You know, we used to have these awesome unsung heroes that sat in the corner and figured out in a very uh, methodical way how our binaries would be created. We thought about what libraries should be brought down, what source code should be brought down, what compile flags should be used. Um, we might have used um, uh, something like an artifactory or a, a Maven repository to check out the transit of dependencies. But at the end of the day, we had a binary that we could trust. I used to tell everybody the way to freak out a developer would be to, de to delete their executables because sometimes it took so long to get that build together, the last thing you wanted to do was to delete all the executables. That is changing. Um, we're still going to have these unsung heroes, and I think most of them are shifting to the role of SREs. But in essence, 
they are going away. The bills are going to be different. Now think about how those bills are going to be different. They're going to be smaller. You don't take a, in a in a in a microservice world. You're probably going to have things like a, a Python function. I mean, if, even if you're using a language like Go, you're going to it's going to be compiled, but it's going to be a small compile. You're not going to be doing this decision making to, to sort out what files, what the library should be put in, and how you build your entire um, jar file because that is actually done over at the runtime. All the linking is literally done through APIs at runtime. So your functions are smaller. Your builds are much quicker. Everybody will be able to achieve a 10-minute build, which is something we've tried to do for quite a long time in the Agile community. And this is definitely um, what the, the direction that the microservice is taking us. Um, but what's missing from that is we got rid of all of the SDMs. Um, software configuration management is still important. Um, so for example, we used to have, when we did a compile, we'd have a bill of material report. And BOM reports are still discussed. These are st is this, this is a still a very important topic, BOM reports. So what a BOM report showed was what went into your build um, and what versions of the software went into your build. And you, know, you create an application version. And we did use that to do diff reports. We said, OK, it's broken today, running in production. We just did a release. What changed? Well. We used a diff reports between two BOM reports to do that. So we could look at two different application versions and see what the differences were in order to start chasing down a problem. This is very, very typical software configuration management. We also had the idea of impact analysis, where we would say we're going to change a library that may be used by multiple people um, or multiple application teams. How, does it, uh, how do we impact if we make a change to that library? What is, what is the overall impact? We still need to do that. Even though microservices should be backward compatible and not have dependencies between them, we are not, none of us are perfect uh, microservice developers. We are not purists. We're there to get the job done, and we know that we're going to have those kind of dependencies. It just happens. So what we're building is what I like to call the Death Star. Um, these are pictures of both the Amazon and Netflix Death Star. These you can find on Google. They're pretty fascinating to look at. Um, Netflix, I think, has over 4,000 microservices they're managing, so you can imagine what kind of job that is to track. Um, it's pretty impressive. Now, the other thing that changes is the release process. So I have now named three uh, main kind of core competencies of our CD pipeline, orchestration, builds, and now releases. With the release process, we are going to do this releases far more frequent. We've always said that we're going to do that. We get, we're really proud if we can do a release every day, and companies who are doing that, that's amazing. But with microservices, you're probably going to be doing literally hundreds of releases per day if you're doing them right. It's like we're building this giant transformer, and we get to transform it on a regular basis. It's not like a Lego set where we put everything together and we sit it on a shelf and say, don't touch it. <laughs> it's really cool to look at, but it's not something to be played with. We're going to be playing with our software from now on, and our software is going to be a, look more like a transformer than a Lego set. So that means that every microservice gets pushed out to the, to the cluster independently. And you're going to have lots of clusters. I think that a lot of companies are experiencing what I like to call cluster sprawl. Um, developers may want their own cluster. Uh, you may have several clusters for testing, and you may even have several clusters for, for, production, for production. Now, while that may change as we move into service mesh, today that is the case. So while the actual deployment of containers is really much easier um, than it used to be for a built, you know, pushing a jar file out to hundreds of uh, physical servers, for example, or even pushing it out to an image, uh, updating a, a container is super simple. But tracking it and understanding the pieces and parts um, is the hard part. And that's what we have to start thinking about in terms of how the landscape changes. So if we add some of these tools, tools like Helm has helped us tremendously um, with being able to create uh, deployment uh, files for pushing things out to container. You have container registries like Quay. Um, you have uh, Ansible. 
uh, for doing configuration management, you have tools like uh, Deploy Hub. It's obviously an area that I'm passionate about, um, and these are sort of the new tools in the market that you can start looking at um, in terms of managing a new modern CD pipeline. Now there are certainly other really important pieces of the CD pipeline that we don't have uh, the time to really cover today, but let me just pause and go through them. We're still going to have our version control and our issue tracking. That is still going to be um, a standard. But instead of having a version control or, your, or a GitHub repository for your entire application, you're probably going to have a GitHub repository for a single um, microservice. Uh, the, I, in live events, I've asked the question, and most people say that they have one repository for each microservice. Now, issue tracking can become a little, uh, it can change a little bit too, because issue tracking, normally what we do is we track issues as it, as it relates to an application version. But issues now need to be identified based on these smaller units of work, these microservices. So issue tracking is going to have to get smarter about how to, to track a, an application problem to a microservice. And issues will be opened against microservices. So we need to be able to track an, a, 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 a ticket to a microservice as it relates to an application. The other things that are becoming much more popular, and I, I feel like there's a lot to discuss around it, is container security. Container security continues to be um, uh, a, a focus for most organizations. Security is really hot right now. DevSecOps is a really hot area. And the problem is not necessarily um, with running the, the, the container security. The problem becomes the volume and the, and a, the scaling. So instead of just, run, just running a scan against a jar file, you're going to be running scans against containers for hundreds of microservices. So both like the testing, the issue tracking, and the, the, the security scanning, all of that is impacted by the, just the volume. Remember in our, uh, in our CD pipeline, we're going to have many workflows. Those many workflows are going to be calling security scanning and being related back to issue tracking on a, on a more um, voluminous, you know, we're going to have lots of it instead of just one or two, we're going to have lots of workflows. So the orchestration in the CD process becomes even more critical because automation is required. There's, we're not going to be able to do this by hand. Uh, this is not an email solution. In order to succeed here, we have to build out a very solid CD pipeline that can really connect the dots for every single microservice. So what do you think? Let's just kind of go review what um, I just went over. There's quite a bit of information in that. Um, what's going to be different in a Kubernetes pipeline? This is basically what we're talking about. Um, as we talk, code will be smaller. Um, and think about it. There's going to be le less branching and merging. So while we are still going to version our Golang or our, our uh, Python scripts, uh, the version becomes less critical because we're not relying on it to do so much branching and merging. Um, and in fact, the concepts of branching and merging sort of change uh, with a microservice architecture. Um, the library management and versioning will shift to runtime. Uh, that is a pretty big change. Again, when we do a build, we're not doing that, um, the linking at that time and making uh, decisions about how we want our, uh, li what libraries we want to include in our, our big binary. So we have to think about that still, but we have to think about it in a different way. And the versioning um, aspect is critical. What versions of my microservices make up my logical view of my application? These are the questions we have to start asking ourselves. And builds themselves will be super short, you know, uh, five to ten minutes. Everybody will achieve that, uh, that ten-minute build. Um, Jez Humble will be proud of all of us because I know every talk I've ever heard him do, he always talks about the importance of getting clean, fast builds. Well, we're going to get there. Um, and when you run a build, it's going to be about creating a container, and that container um, is going to be registered. So our binary repositories now will be container registries. Now what we get is a lot more sharing and reuse between um, these, these functions. 
on, I didn't even go into talking about what we what's often referred to as a domain driven design. And if you're moving into a microservices world, or let's just say you're looking at your existing application and you want to start thinking about it in terms of breaking it down into individual components. I highly recommend that you take a look at microservices.io. Um, it, this is a fabulous site. There's training that you can take um, uh, through this site about microservices. And one of my favorite areas that he talks about is uh, uh, domain-driven design. Now, we tried to do this in object-oriented programming. But the reason why we did not succeed is because we were not good at figuring out how to manage shared libraries in a compile and link step. So what we did instead was we would rename our, um, our reusable objects so we would have private versions of them. So it didn't become reusable, it became copied. So we branched it all over the place. And we oftentimes didn't even branch it using version control. We used it by branching, we, we created branches by creating new names, which is even worse. We don't want that kind of uh, solution around microservices. We don't, want we don't want everybody renaming their microservice so that they're using a specific one. That is not the intent of microservices. So as you stop and, and start looking at the, your CD pipeline, you have to deal with the, the, the areas that I just discussed. But you also want to think about a practical way of breaking down your, your and, and decomposing your application into microservices. And what you're going to start finding especially if you did two or three at a company and really looked at them, you're going to find patterns. And we're going to hear that word um, more and more, this, uh, this concept of patterns, organizational patterns, and how we share those patterns across, um, across these separate silos that are in these larger uh, enterprises. In other words, how does the person on the eighth floor know what the person on the fourth floor wrote? If they wrote something that they can use, a pattern, a, a, a single sign-on, or data access routines to get common data, how do we know that? Domain-driven design helps to solve the sharing problem because it allows you to organize your microservices into solution spaces, often referred to as problem spaces. I like to call them solution spaces. And once you start doing that, you are far, you, you're, you're much farther down the road than you realize. If you can start seeing your decomposed applications in terms of domains and how those, do, the, those problem or those solution spaces should be shared across your organization, um, you're going to avoid the pitfalls that we saw with object-oriented programming and the lack of a good structure for managing um, reusable components. And then lastly, really think about your application as a logical, um, as a logical collection of microservices. It's still there. You just have to see it in a different way. And it's made up of a collection of components, and those components could be database updates, uh, it could be infrastructure updates, and it could be microservices. But the application version is still there, and you need to you need, don't throw it out with the bathwater. <laughs> Uh, sort of in conclusion, giving us some plenty of times, I've got quite a few questions that's come across here, but um, we are morphing. The CI/CD process, process is really morphing. Um, it needs to move faster. We need to be able to progress uh, these tiny microservices through the CD pipeline in a much on a much faster pace. Um, it will be uh, require lots of automation. We need to move away as much as possible from one-off scripted processes, and we need to start thinking about how these um, uh, tasks can be event-driven so that we can execute many, many um, events at, at the same time. Uh, when we're talking about progressing small moving parts with, with potentially many connections, we need to rethink ab the, about the configuration management problem and understand that we lose some of that configuration management, that core configuration management data, because we're not doing a, a, a software compile and link process anymore, where we have bomb reports and diff reports. And then I would say watch for new tooling. We're going to see um, new tooling enter, entering the market. And we're going to start seeing, I believe, some of the back-end processes, the ops processes like, um, like APM, uh, having more of a conversation with our uh, our CD engine. 
we should be able to, the CD engine should be smart enough to indicate that a microservice has never been used or can be deprecated. It's that kind of information that we might be pulling from these APM tools based on a cluster to make some better decisions uh, in our CD process. So I guess what I'm saying is maybe tomorrow's CD pipelines will be smart. They'll have truth tables and they'll look very different from what we're doing today because we have to manage a lot of little pieces all at the same time, but still recognize that we're providing application solutions to our end users. Uh, if you want to see the, the landscape, um, I highly recommend you go out to the CD Foundation. Here's where you can find the, um, the landscape. And we encourage you to update it. You can um, update the landscape if there's a new tool out there that you feel fits into the landscape that other people should know about. Um, you can, this is an open source community. You can create a pull request to add, that, uh, to add a, um, a, a company or even an open source solution that you might be using to the landscape. Um, and we encourage you to do that because this is how we begin sharing information and this is how we begin to morph the CD process to support a cloud native microservice environment. So again, I keep referring to the transformer. That is what we're doing. Um, and as we've heard, the best companies have transformed themselves from monolithic to microservices. Companies like Netflix and Google and Facebook, thank goodness Netflix is running microservice because imagine how many people are watching Netflix these days of, of COVID. Um, and I know your company's next. So how do you get there and uh, how, do you, how are you successful? It's really going to depend on your domain-driven design, how you morph your CD pipeline, and how well you can automate to, to address the volume of changes that will be pushed across that pipeline. Um, talk to me. I love having conversations. I try to uh, block my calendar out uh, for uh, at least the mornings generally. Uh, to talk to people about what they're doing in, the, uh, in, in this new CD space. I find it fascinating. The more I talk to individuals, the more I learn what they're um, addressing, and the more I can help others by sharing that information. So please reach out. I would uh, love to have a conversation with anybody on this call, um, and uh, we can d geek out about microservices and CD pipelines. And on that, I think I will go through some of the questions. Um, and really, everybody, thank you for the great questions that have come through here. There's several. Um, some of them are some personal ones, and I think I'll start with that uh, first. Um, I was asked, um, I want to know about a DevOps career, and what, what, should I, what should I do to prepare for it, and how did you get into DevOps? Um, I as I said in a podcast recently, I stubbed my toe and found myself in DevOps. I was a, um, I came from the mainframe world. I was a, right out of college, I was a COBOL programmer working on, um, uh, you know, working in, on Wall Street writing, you know, trading applications uh, in, on the mainframe. And we had something called Endeavor. And Endeavor was a, a tool that you would check in your, your COBOL program um, it would automatically do the, the link edit step, um, and there would be an approval process to push it across to the LPAR that it should run in. Yes, Endeavor was the first DevOps tool. And in fact, it stands for Environment for Development and Operations. It's still running today and runs most countries, to be quite honest. Uh, it is a, was an extremely important tool for the mainframe. And when I left the mainframe, I was shocked that I had to write my own compile JCL, basically. I was like, I have to write my own compile JCL? Why can't I just check it into something and it compiles it, links it, and sends it off for me? I had been spoiled. So I served as a, a, a software developer for years, and I learned to write make files, and we wrote scripts to do the deployments. But I always thought that we should be able to get back to a continuous delivery model like they did on the mainframe. So that's how I got into this, this business. Um, I worked for, uh, as a contractor, and I started getting jobs where I was managing um, the build and the release process, as well as the testing process. And I found that I was really good at it, because I have a, a kind of a mind for puzzles, and I liked putting things together. And that's, that's how I, I got into the business. 
Now, for anybody moving into this area, um, I feel like it, it's really important right now to understand Kubernetes as a whole. Uh, getting certifications in Kubernetes, getting certifications in AWS is, the, is sort of the core of understanding. When you understand what the, how the production environment uh, runs, or how the, I should say the runtime environment operates, you, be, you, you get a good foundation to build on top of it. Once you understand that, you can start understanding how applications run because microservices themselves are core to the new kind of way we're going to develop um, applications. And understanding how those microservices operate in the runtime environment is going to be critical. So my suggestion for anyone looking into getting into DevOps is to start on the ops side and start looking at how you can get certified in those, in, in those areas. And there are some really good online classes that you can uh, take for learning that. Um, another question is more of a technical question, um, and that has to do with really, you know, what is basically the question is asking what's the difference between qu continuous delivery and continuous deployment. Thank you very much for asking that because it is a confusing topic, isn't it? <laughs> continuous delivery in my world, when I say continuous delivery, I am talking about the orchestration. Um, the orchestration of the, the continuous delivery process as a whole. Uh, those are tools like Jenkins and Circle CI and Jenkins X and um, Spinnaker. Those are orchestrating the process. There is an ecosystem in that process. What it's orchestrating is the ecosystem. And I, when we, we talk Don't know if you guys can hear me. No place to test it. Oh, good, you can hear me. Yay, yay, party, party. <laughs> so anyways, continuous delivery is the orchestration. Continuous deployment is actually moving your code out to your runtime environments. Tools that are do continuous deployment are um, tools that focus on the release problem and not orchestrating everything on the top level. Um, so when people talk about continuous delivery and continuous deployment, they sometimes mix those concepts. But in my world, delivery is orchestration because we're talking about the progression of software from dev through prod. Um, deployment is actually doing the, the updates to those runtime environments. So a deployment is moving a, a is updating a container in a cluster, and there. While that seems very simple, there are other things that uh, continuous deployment tools do to track when it was re released and um, when it was changed. And there's lots that it, continuous deployment tools do that continuous delivery tools don't do. Um, think about it as different as continuous test and continuous deploy and continuous delivery. Those are three different things. Um, and I like to talk about continuous configuration management. It's not continuous delivery, it's a part of the ecosystem. And what I was going to show before I dropped off <clears throat> is this landscape defines that. So think about the continuous delivery is, this is everything. And tools like Spinnaker and Jenkins and CircleCI and, and you know, CodeFresh 
they're at the their orchestration tools they call these other tools inside the ecosystem that do a lot of the heavy lifting and are are critically important to um, a, a successful automated CD process Let's see what other good questions I know audio is gone again thank you for everybody for telling me I guess I'll do um, one more question um, and the question relates to uh, the build process and why it is so different um, if you've ever worked in a uh, on the build side of the house uh, you will you would learn that you write what is often called like a build script it could be written in uh, for maven or ant or traditional make or could just be a script that calls things in an order and when you pull things together at that point you are defining ahead of time what libraries should be um, included and what you want your end user to actually execute environment you're pushing microservices I'm gone again. So what happens is, is that you can't uh, as easily understand what your application's configuration is as you did in the build process. Because a microservice could up be updated. Let's say you're using a security up uh, microservice. It could get updated, and it creates a new version of your application. In the old days, you would have compiled and linked it with that new version, and you would have known ahead of time, before you ever deployed it out to production, that it changed. And I think that uh, th those are probably the the core of my the core of the questions. Most of them have gone to we're we've lost you. I'm so sorry that that did happen. Um, and if you again, if you want to chat with me, uh, reach out to me. Here's my information, um, and I am always available. Um, there's my my coffee chat uh, link. Uh, just pull that down and schedule a time with me, and we can chat for 15 minutes. And thank you to the, uh, um, the Linux Foundation and the Open Source Summit for inviting me. I'm uh, honored to be able to speak. And everybody stay safe in the world of COVID. Wear a mask. Thank you.